So um, you guys are either having really great conversations about this or something else, and I hate to interrupt you, but I am going to interrupt you. So if you guys can wrap up your conversations there, and we'll bring you back here for a moment. <laughs> yeah. So if you could wrap up your conversations, we're going to draw your attention back to the front of the room here, and we'd really like you to share some of what you're talking about in your small groups, especially if it pertains to an MP3 plan. <laughs> So um, we, have a, we have a few minutes here, and what we want to do is to capture some of the thoughts that are going on in these conversations. Um, so if I could ask you guys to, to pop up, um, and actually, Mike, could you run a mic for us? Do you mind? Um, is that mic still on? Mike, Mike the mic. So um, what we'd like to do is to hear from some of folks, um, this conversation that you're just having right now. So if there's a specific question that's gnawing you that, you know, you're sitting with in your state that you've been talking about, we want to capture that. Or, you know, if there's another comment on this early part of the process, we want to hear that. So let's, I'd like to hear from, you know, three, four, five people. So who's got something they want to share with the group and let us know what you were talking about in your smaller group there. Great. Ed, please get us kicked off. <laughs> Okay, 
you know, we've got several, you know, Missouri was on the, the list is we haven't developed a plan. Well, right now, all I know about is, you know, some drift watch programs. But I was thinking of other agencies that need to be involved, uh, departments of transportation, because they're going to be near agricultural lands, how they manage invasive species, teasel, uh, uh, Cerisial spds, whatever is going to affect, you know, agricultural production, which is going to affect, you know, whatever, chemicals, etc. Um, also, utility right-of-ways. In a good portion of Missouri, it's Ameren, Missouri. In Western Illinois, it's Ameren, Illinois. It's technically the same company, but how they deal with the right-of-ways is different. In Missouri, it's backpack hand spraying. In Illinois, it can be aerial spraying. So that is going to have an effect. And one species that we also particularly need to consider, since we have a Missourians for Monarchs program, we're developing a statewide program mm -hmm. for Monarchs, they also have to be part of that mix too. Mm -hmm. So there's, I could keep going on, but I'll just limit it to that for right now. No, that's great. I think what you're underscoring, Ed, is, the, is that one of the early steps here is um, not only understanding what kind of pollinators you have um, in the state, whether those are native or managed or monarchs or anything like that, that's going to impact. And then I also hear, and, and we heard this a little bit this morning, not just the ag piece of this, but what are the non-ag pieces that may actually be impacting? So I think it's a, it's a, it's a great point to underscore, Ed. Someone else um, from your conversations or, or reflections on this question that you're sitting with or other ideas? Yeah, I got one here. Hello. Hello. So, You're behind the pillar. <laughs> so we were asking, and the conversation was, you know, different people to include. Not all states have state beekeeping associations, but the majority of them do. I think really only two don't. So if you're looking for beekeepers and beekeeping groups, instead of just going to an individual person, which sometimes starts to pit beekeeper against beekeepers, start with the state beekeeping association, because either way, they represent those states' beekeepers. So that we don't want to think of just including commercial beekeepers or just backyard beekeepers or just sideliner beekeepers. There are all three types. All three will be impacted by the state plan. So we need to include all three types of beekeepers. So that one beekeeping group doesn't speak for the other. But start with the State Beekeeping Association. They speak for all state beekeepers. That's great. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, wait. Go ahead. So to add to that, uh, we tried to balance our first meetings with the number of uh, people that were in the room so that we didn't have an overabundance of producers and beekeepers. Mm. And we rounded up the, the row crop producers, but we contacted the Mississippi Beekeepers Association and asked them to send their representatives so we weren't picking and choosing so to speak who they wanted to bring in but uh yes get to know the president of your state beekeeping association mm -hmm. pretty well great thanks andy and I'm curious if anybody tackled uh, the question that Dewey had brought up, um, which is if you've got migratory beekeeping coming through your state or, or, or tribe area, how might you tackle that representation? Did anybody start to discuss that? Great. We have a microphone coming to you. Thank you. In Michigan, we run about 50 to 75 families that we would call commercial operations. Mm -hmm. They're all migratory at this point. I think mm -hmm. the last of them have finally given in our moving bees south. So as we consider that, we, we have both beekeeper association and we have a commercial beekeeper association. So we've been, uh -huh. for the last year and a half, keeping both groups aware that we will be working on this, that this will be coming. So mm -hmm. nobody, it's no surprise to anybody. But because our migratory beekeepers are in Florida, Georgia, California this time of year, we have to be very mm -hmm. cognizant of the fact that the traditional times that our beekeepers groups meets, they're not in town. Yeah. So we have to plan around their schedules. Yeah. We have to work with their schedules. And yeah. you know, in talking, we have the president of our commercial beekeepers is in probably in the other room right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's real honest. Until May, we're not available. You know, we get back and then we do early yeah. pollination, so we're not available. So right. we have to plan to meet directly with those individuals and deal with their needs uh, when, when we can, talk to them every chance we get and include them in any discussions by, by the representation, whether it be talking to each one individually or meeting with them mm -hmm. separately. Yeah. 
please. This is controversial, but I can't stop thinking about it. Um, God bless everyone who believes in climate change and everyone who doesn't believe in climate change. God bless everybody. But I worry about the elephant in the room. Um, and what if you end up with some people that because there isn't sufficient source material in the research um, end up saying this is all bogus. Mm -hmm. You can't prove that um, the pesticides are really hurting the bees. Show me, show me the data. So then I think, what about research review boards being a part of the MP3 development plan? Um, do you go to universities and ask them for a research review board? Is that gonna give you a neutral research review board? Maybe not. Maybe some universities have agendas because they need funding for their research. Mm. And that's really important because without funding, there's nobody doing the research. Right. So how do you create a neutral review board of the research mm -hmm. so that we don't have to have an elephant in the room so we can be factual? Mm -hmm. Great. Sounds like a question that you're sitting with and that other folks may be sitting with as well. Anyone else? Yes, please. Here, we'll get you a uh, microphone. Thanks. I have a stuffy nose, so I <laughs> sound a little. Um, my question is to states, particularly in Arizona and New Mexico. We are um, a tribe. We're situated. Um, a majority of the land is in Arizona, and then the rest is in New Mexico, and a little portion of it is in Utah. So we found out that we have a migratory pollinator group that comes in from California that comes to the ag agricultural area of the nation and um, they come at certain times and we would like to have, I mean, it, the, the, my question is should we, is it recommended that, that we do a MP3 or should we work with our states to see if we can um, be part of their plan? What, 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 what is the recommendation? Mm -hmm. Well, let me see if, if anybody has uh, um, an answer to that. Otherwise, we're gonna put that on the board as a question we're sitting with. Did you wanna respond to that in particular? Please, okay. Can we hand that microphone back to him? Thank you. Um, first off, I'd, I'm grateful that we've got both states and tribes in here. Um, my input for your question is this. When a tribe has some type of economic activity that is not an economic endeavor of the tribe occurring on tribal land, whether it's reservation land or fee land, that tribe has a responsibility to their people to either monitor that or to the extent possible be in control and regulation thereof. So. What I would say to you on that is absolutely get your own uh, plan in place. If you can coordinate with your state and have a plan that dovetails in nicely with theirs or the multiple states where, where y'all are, great, more is the better. But the thing that I would caution you about and, and all of our tribal representatives here is in the past 10, 12 years, we've begun to see particularly through uh, climate change, policies and procedures through other um, legislative things that have come out of Washington, particularly with things relating to the environment, land management, we've seen a very significant erosion of tribal sovereignty. And my fear is that if we as tribal people and representatives of Indian nations don't develop these plans and don't work with our states and establish that clear boundary of you know, where the, the tribal nation begins and the state ends, for something as simple and small as a honeybee, the size of my thumb, it's just, it continues to allow that erosion of sovereignty and self-determination. Yeah. So that was a long walk around the mulberry bush to tell you, get your own plan <laughs> for your lands, for your reservation. Thank you. Ed, then last comment here, and then we're gonna move on to our next piece, please. I just want to add one follow-up to that statement and question, which also relates to the MP3s. 
One concern of, about honeybees in some locations is competition with native bees. And when you're looking at traditional forms of agriculture, as was brought up um, early this morning, and issues of food sovereignty, where the native bees are going to be a part of that, if you don't have a plan that how the honeybees are also managed in that area too, it could affect some of your local traditional foodstuffs. Um, and where there is issues with competition is in more uh, arid environments, where you have more ephemeral resources with plants, mm. um, and some tropical environments. So this is an area which, particularly for the Southwest, is also a concern too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Ed, for that piece. Um, I'm gonna put um, just a finer point on the comments um, about uh, the different beekeeper constituencies um, and underscoring the, the timing um, that, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, General Mike from Michigan had said, um, I know that in North Dakota, to address the issue of including, being inclusive of beekeepers as well, that they actually had a lot of their meetings in the summer, which was tremendously inconvenient for their growers and ac applicators, but it was very convenient for their beekeepers. And so that, that thinking of that cycle, that timing, um, and, and also some other states have also not just had one massive convening, which inevitably folks are not going to be able to do, but figuring out how to do maybe multiple convenings at different times that can attract and uh, you know, and catch the attention of different people and then having a, a process to weave the, the input together is another way to do that. And finally, um, in addition to, you know, getting to know your state um, beekeeping association president, um, also looking at there are some national beekeeping um, associations that in particular, if you're, if you think you've got you know, a, a large number of migratory commercial beekeepers coming into your state, you're not sure how to get a hold of them, that's another resource. Those those national associations could be a resource to talk talk to them about who might be, um, you know, coming into your state and who might be able to, to um, have a conversation, be part of a conversation on your end. So with that, we're going to move on to the next part of our agenda, and I'm going to introduce our next two speakers as I fumble for their... Introduction. Um, so the next part of this, we are going to get into um, a little bit more about the elements of uh, the MP3 and, and what should be in there and be a part of that. We have two folks who are going to help us today to do that. The first is um, Mike Arts, and Mike is the Director of Production and Supply Chain for, Florida Fruit, for the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association where he generates emergency exemptions, special and, and local registrations, and works on other pesticidal issues, including pollinator-related issues. He's gonna talk a little bit about the Florida experience. We also have Liza Fleeson Trosbach, who's program manager for the Office of Pesticide Services for the Virginia Department of Ag and Consumer Services. She's currently serving as program manager there and in this position directs the statewide pesticide program and administers the Virginia Pesticide Control Act and related regulations. Um, throughout her career, she has worked in environmental and public health programs within the Departments of Health, Corrections, and Ag. So please welcome these. Mike, I'm going to have you get started and then Liza, have you come up and then we'll do some questions combined. Sorry, this is, you know, on the fly. So I'll get you started here. And um, Mary is going to be giving you time cues. Good luck with that. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, Stace. <laughs> People have expectations. Uh, it, it's a natural thing. When folks travel to Florida, they have the expectation that it's going to be warm and sunny and you're going to get a snow tan. Most of, those time, most of the time, those expectations are met. But there are other such times when, those, when certain situations arise where those expect, expectations are completely snowed under. I, for, I just want to give you some, some encouragement that during the, the development and execution of various MP3s, your expectations most of the time are going to be met. But some of those expectations you're going to realize are going to be snowed under as you're going about this process. But in Florida, we're really pretty lucky. From a pollinator standpoint, we've got stuff that's blooming 12 months a year. From, a, from an environmental standpoint, we don't have to deal with the cold and the freezes and the frost that every other state has to typically deal with. From a land management standpoint, 
We don't have the millions of acres of, of monocrop sort of situations. Florida has a very diverse plant portfolio. So from a pollinator standpoint, things work, it, it's, I guess you could say it, it's a be good kind of area. And along those be good situations is the fact that when it comes to the population, number of bees that we do find in the state, these are University of Florida data, and they're showing that since the definition of colony collapse disorder, Florida's bee populations are continuing to increase. Of course, this is a, 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 a momentum thing that we'd like to keep going, but, and of course there always has to be a but when you deal with these sort of situations. So I'd kind of like to explain for you a little bit as to what happened with respect to how we came in developing the MP3 for citrus crops in Florida. This is what a typical citrus grove looked like, oh, a dozen years ago or so. Citrus is obviously a big business in the state, and you may or may not be aware of the fact that uh, orange blossom honey is also a big business within the state. But you can see here, you know, you've got a dense canopy, a foli foliar canopy, you've got a good fruit load. That was the situation about a dozen years ago. Take that visual and compare it to what the grove looks like today, which is more along the lines of this. And no, those trees have not been harvested yet. This situation is called because of an exotic disease that got transplanted into citrus called citrus greening. It's transmitted by an insect. It's a bacterial problem. The insect infects the tree, and once the bacteria get inside the vascular system of the tree, the bacteria is there forever. Until the tree dies, you can't get rid of it. So it, it's, it obviously has become a very huge problem. You don't have any foliage to deal with. You'll see uh, the fruit typically end up on the ground. This is the tree realizing that it's sick, trying to save itself. So it sheds all the fruit to try to save the carbohydrates. But the problem is it sheds those fruit a month or two before harvest is supposed to take place. So when you have that situation occur, obviously your yields are gonna drop substantially. And along those lines, as you can see, like from the first picture, these are the yield data from a dozen years ago or so. Uh, we're to the point now where we have lost 70% of our yields to this, to, solely to this disease. 70%. Obviously, that's not a sustainable situation. There's a lot of desperation within the producer community uh, just to try to save their trees, to try to save their crop, to try to save their, their grove sort of thing. So along those lines, we knew that there was going to be a problem. But this is just a quick picture of, of the actual insect that transmits the, the disease. It's called an Asian citrus psyllid. And this psyllid has its face plastered up against the leaf, feeding away kind of thing. And that's just an index finger so you can get an idea of how small the, 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 the critter really is. Um, but all the psyllids now are hot with the bacteria. They transmit the bacteria on their saliva when they're feeding. So right now, the um, threshold for psyllids in a grove is less than zero. Um, and anytime a psyllid is found, it, 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 causes, it stirs a nervousness along those lines. Uh, and what also happens then too is it's the fact that obviously we, had to, we realized we had to develop, come into, into play with, with an MP3 system. Because of the fact that we had the psyllids there, guys were desperate, there was some, uh, they, were, they were ignoring some of the situations revolving around label language and that sort of thing. So we had a couple of incidences that <coughs> cued us into the fact that if we don't do something now, we're gonna have a lot more in the way of troubles later. So we decided to put together a, a situation where we could put together an MP3 holistically. We got 250 people in the room made up of growers, beekeepers, academia, uh, state regulators, crop protection industry folks, and figured, okay, well, let's go through and start this whole thing. Well, our expectations immediately were snowed under when we got everybody in the room um, because there was really a complete lack of understanding of all the different perspectives that were going on. We literally had one grower stand up and at the microphone said, you keep your blankety blank bees out of my grove, they're causing me liability, they're trespassing on my property and they're stealing my nectar. Theoretically, I guess that's all true, but there again, he, there was not a complete understanding of the system that's, that's involved with all, this whole thing. So to get some momentum, we actually, and, and to, to, to communicate the significance of the situation, 
we brought in our uh, commissioner of agriculture. He got up in front of the room and basically said, well, we have a problem, but the, the citrus industry is not gonna go under during my watch. The, orange, the honey industry is not gonna go under during my watch. We're gonna lock the door, we're gonna park our egos, we're gonna talk about this, we're gonna figure it out, we're gonna come up with a solution. And it took that kind of spanking, <laughs> I guess you could call it, in order to get this whole thing really moving forward with, with, to, to where we are to the point today. And since the MP3 for citrus has been put in place, I'm not aware of any reported bee kills because the lines of communication are so much more open because of the fact that um, there's a un much more in the way of understanding of what's taking place and what has to take place. Whereas we had multiple situations where bee kills were occurring prior to the implementation of the MP3. Now, you might have had some expectations that we'd come here today with a golden list for you, to, a checklist that you could just take home and, and complete and be on your way with, with your particular MP3. I'm afraid that expectation is gonna be snowed under because there's so much in the way of variability, so much, very, so much difference in the way of, with, with respect to environmental situations, so much, dozens and dozens of variability factors that have to be taken into account for each of your specific MP3s that you're trying to develop, there's no such thing as a golden list that's out there. You're gonna to have to try to figure out for yourself exactly what works, what doesn't work. Um, there's, it's, there's no such thing as a one size fits all MP3 program out there. That, that's gonna be something that you have to work through individually. What we are gonna emphasize is the fact that you're gonna to have to have uh, encouragement to, for all involved parties to, to participate in the process. I'm aware of certain states that are trying to put MP3s together that are only including um, academia and regulatory folks. That's not gonna work. From our experience, that is just not gonna work. You're not gonna have the buy-in from the beekeeper side, you're not gonna have the buy-in from the producer side because they're not at the table helping you to develop the program. So we're gonna have to initially highly encourage everybody to make sure you get all the right folks in the room to start with and continue on from there. That's the way you're gonna get buy-in from this whole thing. Then along those same lines too, you have to make sure that once you're done with your MP3, you're really not done. There's a lot more to do once you are initially done with the, with the MP3 because this is a living document and there's gonna be modifications that have to take place as you learn more, as other things are developed along down further, further on down the road. So don't be thinking that once you're done, you're done because that's really not the case. Now, something else that I think is really important that you, can, that you really need to try to incorporate into the whole system as you're going forward with any MP3 sort of situation is the fact that you're going to have to do whatever you can to make sure you get some sort of an apiary inspection infrastructure in place that's, that's involved with that particular MP3 process. Because this is where they're going to really figure out what works and what doesn't. When you have someone on the ground who's doing those analyses to figure out, yes, here, this is not so good, we need to improve this. Over time, that's when, that's when the real benefits will evolve and that's when the real uh, important additions will continue to take place along those lines. I mentioned the word contracts here. A lot of folks like to, would like to see contracts implemented into the OMP3 process. I'd exercise caution along those lines. If you're gonna have a contract, uh, make it a contract that's between the grower and the beekeeper kind of thing. I'd suggest having a disclaimer in there that you do not want to have this contract overlap into chemical label sort of thing. Because you've got a contract that's it's its own entity and you've got the label that's its own entity. You don't want uh, your, your state department of ag compliance officers will more than likely tell you they do not want that overlap between the label and the contract. Those are separate documents. So make sure there's some sort of disclaimer in there to keep those separate. And I've seen some other examples of contracts out there that have statements like, um, do not apply a chemical that may be toxic to pollinators. Well, I can make water toxic to pollinators. If I apply enough water long enough, it's going to kill the pollinator. So statements like that really have to be monitored because those can be real gotchas as you go forward with this process. I'd suggest also putting together a, a label interpretation document. What this is, we did this in Florida. We just took every single insecticide registered for citrus. Is it allowed for use in bloom or not? No? Okay, we're done with that. If yes, 
You go, for, go in further and di document exactly how it can be used during bloom. What are the specific specifics that require its use during bloom? All, all that sort of thing, so it's all in one document to simplify the process for all parties involved. It's all right there. Keep on throwing out there the ideas out there to reduce risk. There's a lot of expertise in the industry. Exercise that expertise as much as you can. And then come up with another program to make sure that once you get everybody involved, you keep them involved. Because you don't want people just slipping away and, and not involved in the process going forward because you're going to get more in the way of better ideas the more you keep the more people together. And then also have that plan for your outreach and your in increased communication as you go forward because communication is the key. We've heard that repeatedly today. So make sure that line of communication stays open. And with that, I've got an expectation that there's probably some questions, so you just have to let me know whether I'm tanned or snowed under here. Okay. All right, so before I get started to talk about um, the different um, elements in a plan um, and kind of how we did it or how we approached it in, uh, in Virginia, um, I want to kind of set the stage since you've, we've just talked about identifying your stakeholders and who you're going to have at the table. So I want to kind of let you know um, that piece and kind of where we are as soon as I find the page down. Okay, so step one, identifying stakeholders and starting the discussion. So just to kind of give you a, a feeling of Virginia, um, what we did as far as our stakeholders were, our primary stakeholders, those that we identified right off the top were, of course, agriculture producers, beekeepers, um, pesticide applicators, because not all ag producers apply their own pesticides, and then they're also non-agriculture and agricultural applications so we just lump those all in, into pesticide applicators and then landowners because in Virginia we have a lot of land that is rented out to somebody else to produce a crop on so we included landowners and then we extended that to, to a lot of the groups that you've already heard about to to extension and to university researchers and to your professional associations that represent producers and beekeepers etc and in Virginia the plan development is with the Office of Pesticide Services, which is why, where I am, the Pesticide Regulatory Group, as well as our Office of Plant Industry Services, which is where our state apiarist and the apiary inspection program is. So those two offices have worked together. We've taken the lead, but we certainly cooperate in that. Okay, so that is our um, kind of the stakeholders that we identified. Some of the other elements that were mentioned you know, briefly was um, you know, how are you going to have your meetings? Are you going to use a facilitator? Just to set the stage, we chose to have seven listening sessions around the state. We invited everybody and anybody who wanted to come. Um, and um, we also used a professional facilitation service out of the University of Virginia. So we provided the technical background from the, pop, you know, the, the, the pollinator population issues. We had that presentation. We had the, how did we get here? from the presidential directive to today, and then we let the facilitation group take over the rest of the meeting. So they were a third party objective and we didn't have anybody thinking, you know, what are you doing? You know, we promote agriculture. I work for agriculture. I like to eat. I'm one of those weeds. Where's Andy? I'm a weed. I have bees in my backyard. I'm growing, growing like weeds. I'm one of those people. I love bees. So we, uh, we, we present it as there's a lot of issues that affect pollinators. We know that. Pesticides is one little piece, but that's the piece that we have some control over and that's what we're going to focus on and everybody has a responsibility. So that's how we kind of prefaced everything that we started to kind of set the stage. Okay, so how do we decide on what was going to be in our plan? You know, what are those critical elements? We did not draft a plan and then go out, but we did put together a framework. We felt like we needed a place to start. So. How do we come up with those critical elements? Well, you've heard a couple times and it was handed out the Safari Red Guidance document. I think you all have that. And that document was put together by the State Fit for Issues Research and Evaluation Group, which are state lead agencies like myself, um, in consultation with the Environmental Protection Agency. And this plan has what, what were determined to be critical elements in a plan, those that states should really have in the plan, optional or recommended elements that should be in the plan, 
And then it also included some select resources at the end. So you could see North Dakota's plan and Colorado's plan, et cetera. And remember, the beauty of this is that it's flexible, right? So your state can have whatever plan works for you. That's the beauty of a voluntary, proactive approach is that you can do what's best for your state and your conditions, and nobody's telling you exactly what to do. It's a really great opportunity. So when we looked at this, we looked at the critical elements, and there were seven critical elements that this document laid out. The first was that any plan should have a method for growers, applicators, to know if there are managed pollinators near the treatment um, area. Okay, so you need to know where the beehives are. It indicated that there should be a method for growers and applicators to identify and contact the beekeepers so they, so they can let them know that there's an application. It should include best management practices uh, to minimize the risk of pesticides to bees, and that could be for the growers and the applicators and, um, and the beekeepers. It called for a, um, uh, a public outreach, you know, an education program. Obviously, if you have a plan, you need to let people know and, and, and tell them about it so they can participate. There should be a process to review and modify that particular um, plan, a mechanism to look at the effectiveness. Obviously, that's part of the discussion here as well. And then stakeholder participation, which I ha have, have mentioned and you've heard a lot about today. And then there were also those optional elements that were put in this plan. Obviously, there are many options that people have. But what was provided in this document was there should be communication with crop advisors and an agricultural extension service. There should be, or there could be, you might want to cons consider crop-specific or site-specific plans. And then finally, there was a recommendation for more formalized agreements between beekeepers, crop producers, um, and property owners, especially in situations where there's a financial agreement. So that was something that the group felt states might want to consider when, when, uh, when putting their plan together. So before we even started with that framework, where we, where, where we identify what we thought were those critical things that we needed to get input on. But before anybody decides, you need to know certain things. You need to know your state's agriculture industry, your beekeeping industry, and your applicator community. You know, you need to know what the issues are, what the feelings are, what kind of beekeeping industry you have. Do you have primarily commercial, app or, or commercial beekeepers? Do you have sideliners? Do you have hobbyists in Virginia? So you know the vast majority of our folks are just like me. They're in the backyard. 2, 10, 20 hives maybe. That's our beekeeping industry. Very different than North Dakota, very different than Florida. You need to know your state's issues and concerns. You know, what are your pest pressures? Because the first thing that people think when they call walk into a room is, you're going to tell me I can't apply pesticides to my corn. And that's the, you know, the, you know that's the mentality. So you have, to, you have to be ready for that and know if there's a pest pressure, obviously people have to make an application. You need to make that clear, you know, that, that that's not going to do it. I um, mean, you know that your pollinator health status, what is the health of your pollinators? Are your hives going up? Are your hives going down? Are you pretty much average? We're just average in Virginia, you know, but, but you, we're also funding a lot of research. There are severe issues with nutrition and nosema and, and mites and a whole variety of things. And there are, of course, pesticides found in the hives, both those that are applied by beekeepers as well as those that are not applied by beekeepers. And, and you need to know the situation. Do you have a lot of bee kill reports? Because somebody's going to ask. Do we, have a, do, you, you know, do we have a big issue? We don't in Virginia, or at least it's not reported to us. And we have, an, we have, we have occasional you know, situations. And you need to determine the scope of your plan before you decide what your critical elements are. Are you gonna just have managed pollinators? And are you just gonna be, is it just gonna be commercial operations or sideliners or hobbyists or all of them? Or are you gonna include native pollinators? That's, that could potentially make a difference in how you approach your plan. Um, for pesticides, are you gonna include all pesticides? Or is it just going to be insecticides? Or is it insecticides and fungicides? Or is it some combination thereof? And you need to decide if you're going to have forage, include forage and habitat issues. Because once again, it can be whatever you want it to be. So these are some of the factors that you need to know. And in addition to that, you need to know what your agency will support or your organization. right? Because ultimately, at least in Virginia, our agency, it's the agency's plan that's being put forward, take into consideration the feedback from the stakeholders and the economic feasibility and cost effectiveness of whatever those components are. So just to share what we have done based on all those factors, one, we decided <laughs> that we're going to um, just you know, focus on managed pollinators for all of those groups, commercial, sideliners, 
hobbyists. We're doing agricultural and non-agricultural applications if, you know, we're, because we're focusing on managed pollinators, okay? Um, all pesticides we decided. While insecticides obviously kill bees, there is some science to support that there are some synergistic effects, there are issues with fungicides, we've heard about insect growth regulators, so we decided why not just reduce the risk of all pesticides to these managed bees. And just so you know, we pick managed bees as opposed to the foraging bees is because that's one thing we can control with the idea is if we add protections here, we will by default protect um, um, native pollinators. Um, we decided to include our current pollinator activities because there's a lot of them that we've already do and have been doing. We wanted to have that part of the plan. We included background information in it. We, want, we included a method for growers and applicators to know if they're managed pollinators, a method for them to have some contact and a method for beekeepers to know where there are potential locations to place hives, so for so potential apiary sites, we decided to include to provide that information. We also provided a, a mechanism for beekeepers to identify and contact those applicators that they, where they may be able to place their bees. We include or are including best management practices for all of those different groups, beekeepers, uh, producers, applicators, and landowners. We have a defined plan for outreach and education. It's going to be reviewed. We're going to you know, measure the effectiveness, and we're going to have stakeholder participation, which obviously we did have with the seven listening sessions. And from those elements that we've done and, and the input we've gotten, we are now drafting the plan. And the next step, just so you know, will be for it to go to an advisory group that's representative of all those different groups for final comments prior to the agency um, deciding. And what we decided to do is also include resource information, because one thing that we found is that beekeepers don't understand agricultural production. Producers don't always understand beekeeping. There's a real misunderstanding of non-agricultural applications and, and vice versa. So we are gonna provide resources that explain the basics of some of those things, including if you're growing a corn crop, this is typically where applications happen. When in that, this is when it flowers. This is, so, so there's just some understanding of, of, of the challenges. And we're also gonna include, of course, EPA, state lead agency, you know, extension websites. And you will see that in, I said it was proposed because that, so what our, our, like I said, our draft plan will go out um, to this advisory group, and from there we will try to gain as much consensus as we can. But as the, as, as the person uh, spoke earlier, you're not always going to get agreement. So sometimes you have to agree to disagree. In which case is why it's the agency that will make the final determination of what ends up in our plan. So thank you. So we're going to take a few minutes and let you guys ask some questions to Mike and Liza, and then we're going to get back into our <laughs> small groups. Um, and I'm going to let Mike run the mics. But um, so any questions from this? Uh, Michelle is right there. Okay, let's go with Michelle, and then we'll come right up here. As we've heard about bee kill reporting and incident data, and that there isn't enough, and we've heard the. I know some USDA and EPA, EPA people are here that the incident reporting system is broken. And yes, it is. Uh, you will notice in the packet you got through the Honey Bee Health Coalition, there is a quick guide to reporting a pesticide-related bee kill incident because many people do not know how to report bee kill incidents. And it, you don't always need to have a lab test. It would be nice if states could pay for those lab tests to determine that, yes, it was pesticides, but then it goes back to a funding issue. So. That's another discussion. But we do need the data. And I think one of the issues, and it's a confusing issue for many people, is when you report your bee kill due to an alleged pesticide exposure, it's data. It's not about suing the farmer. It's not about suing the manufacturer. It's not about even yelling at EPA. It's data. This is what happened in the real world from either a tank mix or legal use of the pesticide. And it's got to be reported. But we will not have that measuring evaluation tool if we don't start reporting the bee kills. But we have got to get this information across to growers that it's not about beating up the grower, it's not about suing them, it's about data collection. So if you will, please, I encourage you, through your states, look at the quick guide to reporting a pesticide-related bee kill. This is the process for doing it, as it starts at the state level and then it goes up to EPA about data collection. But we need to get it across to especially growers and the pesticide applicators is not about blaming. It's about finding out how you're really using the products and what happens when those products are used. Right. Because it's, it's not about lawsuits. It's about data. Please, we need the data. And as many folks are talking about in their state plans, we do not know 
what's happening now? Because beekeepers have gotten finally fed up with reporting because they feel no one's listening. But we need the data, so please, everybody, we, we've got to get more bee kill reports. And, and thanks, Michelle. And it, it is, it, there's a, a packet that you received at the front here with the beautiful Honeybee Health Coalition logo on the front. And it's the, it's the document with the red lines around it here. It's also available for download. So nice plug, Michelle. So we had a question right up here in the blue shirt first, yeah. and then we'll come over. One second. If you Please, Mike. Michelle, yes, in, in Florida, we do have data that are taken with, with any time there's a, a, a bee incident reported. Uh, if there's one reported, the State Department of Ag sends inspectors to that location and conducts a thorough investigation. They'll take bee samples back to the lab, do the analysis. If there is an exposure that did take place, that will come out in that analysis. And we've had a couple of times where fines have been issued because of that definitive information that is generated. And I think you're one of a handful of states who has the money to fund it. The majority right. of the states don't have the money to fund the pesticide analysis. So and that's a, that's a, and that's I think a plus on your part that you were collecting the data. But we've got this cultural history of beekeepers not reporting, and we need them to report. Um, if I can just weigh in, um, I I can say without a doubt that every state lead agency for pesticide regulation investigates complaints, including particularly alleged bee kills. And the, the majority of those, I would say, do take lab samples if it's a, you know if that's what the investigation you know needs. Now, whether or not somebody is reporting an incident, that that's on them. You know, every state lead agency does take those, and particularly because pollinator health is a national issue and initiative by EPA and by default to the states. And so, so it, it, I, I I hate to say that, but I, I I find that hard to believe because you know we are always involved and in talking about this. Now we all have different protocols, and you're right, funding levels are different, but certainly when a, a state gets a report, they are going to investigate that and are going to make the determination if there's a pesticide misuse or whatever's appropriate in that particular situation. Right. Thank you. I, I think um, you, one of the things that we hear at the Honeybee Health Coalition is, is more on the other piece of Michelle's point, which is there's a reluctance to report. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons for that, and, and very, they could be very individual personal reasons. They could be a little bit more systemic based on where you are, but that reluctance to report um, certainly exists. It's something to be aware of as you embark on your MP3s, and it could be something that you do want to address specifically and explicitly in your plan. Um, yes, you had a question, please. Had a, had a question about the logistics of writing your plan. Uh, who wrote it for you, or did you write it yourself if you're a state agency, for example? How did you get funding? Uh, did you have funding sources that you wouldn't consider, for example? How'd you get it down on paper in final form? For the Florida example, uh, it was written by various entities. It was a collaborative effort. There was academia involved and there was uh, Department of Ag involved primarily. Um, and what all was generated then was just assembled ultimately by the Department of Ag and they had the authority then to proceed with things that were agreed upon within the MP3 for Citrus in Florida. Funding, um, there, was, there were no specific funding dollars that were allocated towards the MP3. That was uh, just Part of the daily course of doing business, I guess you could say, is, 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 is under general revenue, I guess, is where those monies would have come from. And is that true with, uh, as far as um, you, know, you had, uh, my, my understanding from Michigan is that we are not going to get very many people from Michigan State University, a researcher, for example, to write a part of a plan without funding, you know, a formal mechanism to actually start that process. So that's the funding. Well, if they have an extension component to their job position, that would seem like that would be a part of their regular job description anyway. <laughs> in, um, in Virginia, um, our program is all uh, non-general revenue. We have a pesticide control fund, and all of the um, funding that's gone into this program is through my office, the Office of Pesticide <coughs> Services. We are actually, I, I talked about the framework, so, so we developed this framework, these things that we wanted input on, and from all of those comments that we received, uh, my staff, along with Plant Industry Services, where the state apiary program is, we are compiling those comments and putting together a draft plan, and then that plan will go out to an advisory group, which is representative of, of each of those major stakeholder groups, including research and extension and, and all of those for, for final comments, and then we're going to make the plan final. Um, 
and, and whatever comes out at the end of the day, the cost will be incurred through our regular funding that, you know, from our fees that we collect. Great. Um, so we're going to um, go back to your handout that had the questions on it. We're going to go to page two. Um, actually, first, let me thank Liza and Mike for your thoughtful um, sharing here. Um, and we're going to go into this. We want you to take a look at this. We're going to do the same thing we did before. Spend, we're going to give you a few minutes to just look at it and jot some ideas down. Then we're going to invite you to talk to the folks around you. First piece um, here is really what is the scope of issues? This really gets to is this purely an ag situation? Is there a non-ag component in your state? What kinds of crop types? What kinds of pollinator types? And then going deeper into that, um, based on the, the, the profile that you're dealing with, what are some of the specific um, issues that you want the plan to address? So we'll give you a few minutes to reflect on those questions. Thank you. 